high call, take two, action. Hello there, <laughs> and welcome to my uh, interesting, I hope you'll find, little vid about an act of bravery and heroism and uh, chivalrous compassion, I think is the best way to describe it. Um, there's a famous book, can you see it here? Uh, a Higher Call by Adam Makos. Uh, he writes the story um, that he learned about, uh, I, think it's his, I think it's his grandfather, but anyway, it's, it's uh, about a guy called Charlie Brown, who was a um, USAF 8th Air Force bomber pilot in World War II. Uh, he was very, very young. He was 21 and told everybody he was 25 to get, <laughs> to get in. Um, and of course the 8th Air Force had quite a tough time bombing Germany and it was very high rate of attrition, very high casualty rate. Um, these men were not expected to last more than three to four weeks at best. Um, and indeed uh, it was you know, quite a, a sacrifice that was made by these people. Um, on the other side you have um, friends in the Luftwaffe and um, they are uh, flying their fighters, defending their own country. Whatever the rights or wrongs of Nazi Germany, we won't get into that here, but um, we have a Luftwaffe pilot doing his duty. And what happened on this particular day was that he went up to intercept Charlie Brown's bomber. Now, Charlie Brown had been over Bremen, northern Germany, and had been bombing, I think it was the Fuckall factory, I think it was the fighter factory. And they'd had a real mauling from the Luftwaffe already and anti-aircraft fire. And you can see in the, the quite famous painting, I'll just zoom you in. There's quite a famous painting here, um, which is on the cover of the book, which you can buy. In which uh, you can see that the, the aircraft was extremely badly damaged. The whole of the front uh, of where the bomb aimer works is gone. That's been shot away. <coughs> the tailplane on the port side is shot away almost completely. Uh, how it was able to fly like that is quite remarkable. <coughs> uh, the, the rear gunner was killed, his uh, emplacement was shot to pieces uh, and uh, he was clearly dead very very instantly and the, the mid gunners were also very badly injured and if you look very closely you can see in the picture that um, the bodywork of the aircraft, the airframe, is shot away so badly it's almost unzipped and anyway so that a very badly damaged aircraft, very unlikely to make it back, and with one engine out as well, which is you can see he's got the propellers feathered in the uh, in the picture. Uh, and uh, the German uh, Luftwaffe pilot was a chap called Franz Stiegler, and he went up to intercept this aircraft um, just north of Bremen, and he saw all this damage I've just spoken about, and he realised that this these guys weren't going to make it and you could actually see in that central area where the body where it was so shot away you could actually see these men cowering and injured wo wounded uh, trying to give each other medical aid and he knew that these guys were in a very bad way um, it, none, none of the guns were able to fire they'd frozen and the ones that weren't frozen were already taken out front and rear uh, and he could realize that there were no threat to him they weren't going to shoot back so he, he he decided that it would be unchivalrous to actually shoot them and he actually said that his thought process was that um, he'd been taught, because uh, this guy had been in North Africa and Sicily campaigns in World War II, and uh, his squadron leader, when he joined them in North Africa, once said, if you ever shoot a man on a parachute, if I ever see you do that, I will shoot you down. Or I'll shoot you when we get back to base, myself. He had a very high code of honour that went back to the First World War. And he always remembered this, and he considered these men in this bomber, this B-17G Flying Fortress, he considered that they were almost like men in a parachute. They were in a really bad way, were not able to shoot back, and he decided not to shoot and actually let them live if they would survive, which he was very doubtful about, and so were they. So anyway, he, he then escorted this bomber for some miles up uh, as far as the North Sea, north coast of Germany and he um, tried to encourage it to fly to Sweden because <laughs> Sweden was neutral and uh, they would be safe there, they wouldn't have to go into prison camp, they'd just be out of the war and they could get there in an hour or so, maybe an hour and a half and they didn't want to do that, the, the American 
guys in the uh, in the bomber wanted to get back to England. You know, they really desperately wanted to get back. So they they resisted this and they carried on uh, they carried on the existing uh, flight path. Um, as you see this sort of action here, it, basically in the in the picture, he's trying to encourage them to turn right to go to Sweden and they're having none of it. Anyway, uh, in the end he realises that they're going to carry on to England but he doesn't think they'll make it, they'll probably crash in the North Sea. And he salutes them and wishes them good luck and he, he peels off. And, um, and they actually fin finally manage to make it back. Uh, probably the most damaged American bomber of the war that actually returned and landed at its home base. Um, in fact, I'm, I'm just trying to recall, I read the book about a year ago, I think they actually landed at another nearby base because they couldn't quite make it all the way. Anyway, they landed and they were back uh, safe and sound apart from the rear gunner who was killed already. <coughs> and uh, it's an amazing book and I can recommend this book very highly, it's all true story. And it also goes into what then happened after the war because when the war was over, uh, Stiegler went on to fly the ME262 jet fighter, which is a very revolutionary first jet fighter in the world. And he, he, he worked with um, Adolf Galland, who, who ran the squadron. And then, of course, the war was over and Americans um, all went back to, to the USA. But what was amazing about the story is that Stiegler um, then decides to um, emigrate to Canada. And uh, he often wondered what had happened to this American pilot and his, and his uh, crew. And little did they know, but for about... 25 years these men lived only about 300 miles apart which was almost neighbours you know in the, the distances of North America um, an amazing situation and uh, had they known they would have almost certainly got in touch with each other anyway they did get in touch eventually via um, uh, I think Stiegler saw an American Air Forces magazine asking for a, some reunion was being organised and he wrote to them uh, and they this forces organisation for the USAF put him in touch with uh, Charlie Brown, who was the uh, who was the pilot, and of course at the time of the incident, Charlie Brown uh, reported how this German had let them go, and uh, they thought it was a great story. And then the the top brass in the USAF buried this story and came back and said, "Don't repeat any of this. We don't want people to think that they don't shoot the Germans." They were a bit worried about this kind of a uh, 1914 armistice type Christmas truce situation developing where they'd stop shooting at each other so um, the story was buried it was never publicized it was never in the papers it was never known about and um, and this is how it became public many many decades later and these guys met up and they became great friends and I'll include a link uh, in the video where you can see various documentaries about this um, but I recommend this book to you very very highly if you've just gone off again I'll just put that back on <coughs> a higher call it was the New York Times um, bestseller in I think it's 2016, 2017. Uh, a tremendously popular book, very heartwarming story, a fascinating insight, which tells you about the sort of uh, uh, the career that Charlie Brown had in the in the States, getting his pilot's wings and, and being given this awesome responsibility when he was only 21, which is too young. And Stiegler's uh, history of going through this, these campaigns in Africa and, and Italy and Sicily, very interesting read. Uh, fascinating. Strongly recommend it to you. Um, I would say that um, the reason I told the story is I wanted to, I was building obviously the, uh, the recent Tamiya uh, Messerschmitt BF 109G6 and I wanted to to make it in the colours of Stiegler who was quite a hero. The most touching thing about this story is, is when you read about uh, and on the documentaries you see all the generations of people in the States who would never have existed if he'd have shot this bomber down. And that's when you realise consequences and historical context of uh, what happens or doesn't happen to the next generation. And it's very, very moving, so I'd really recommend you, you look it up. Um, so anyway, I built the um, I built the model. I'm going to zoom you in now, you've seen enough of me. I built the model here, which uh, I'm very pleased with, and it's in Stiegler's colours. Uh, he was in the uh, Jagerswada JG27, I think that's correct, isn't it? Yes, 27, uh, Group 6. And, uh, and here we have him. Uh, I'm just going to move this back so slightly so that you can see it a bit better. In the camera shot. 
There we go. And bring it forward a touch as well. How's that? That's a bit better, isn't it? So I've, as I say, I've, it's in his colours. I've got the ground crew there working on it. And this is the Tamiya 148 kit uh, with the opening and swappable cowls. So for the purpose of this video, I've got them open. I'll do another video which shows them open and closed. It's a brilliant kit. Can't recommend it highly enough. Um, this clever idea of having these magnets allowing you to interchange the parts is truly amazing. Um, something that you wonder why other manufacturers never thought of this. Uh, it certainly is uh, adding another dimension. And it's not toy-like. It's you have it open or you have it closed. And if you have it closed, you also have the um, the drop tank, which we have here. Uh, here is the drop tank. Oops, sorry, we a shot there. There we go. I don't know if you can make the. Yeah, there we go. Um, yeah, it's got quite a lot of markings on it saying, not a bomb, and all this kind of stuff in German. And then it gives you recommendations about uh, the filling capacity and how not to overfill it and all that kind of thing. So that goes on underneath if you do not have uh, the engine uh, covers open. But it's a lovely model. I, I added the Edouard zoom kit for the interior, so it's got a really, really detailed uh, instrument panel and all that kind of stuff. But uh, anyway, enough of that. More of that on the other video, which will just be not me speaking, just some, some footage and some build uh, photos, etc. But uh, I can certainly recommend it to you. Uh, thoroughly enjoyed that. It took me about 140 hours, perhaps 130. It takes a bit longer because you have to do everything twice. You've got twice as many, um, twice as many of the uh, covers and things to do, top and bottom of the engine, so you've got the duplication. Um, yeah, here they are. So this is the um try to get the zoom in again, I'm sure we can get it. There we go. So that's the cover that will go on when it's closed up. And then underneath similarly there's another one where we have a an engine cover for underneath. Anyway, <coughs> enough of that. Uh hope you found it interesting. Uh strongly recommend that you look up that book. If you're at all interested in this subject, uh, it's an absolutely brilliant read. I can absolutely promise you that. Uh, you won't regret it. I'll just zoom out again and say <coughs> I managed to get this done during this uh, COVID-19 lockdown that we're all having to uh, having to uh, to cope with, which is uh, very difficult times for a lot of people right now. And uh, just want to say, let's all stay safe and wash our hands or wear some gloves, like I'm doing at the moment. <laughs> Uh, that's, that's for modelling purposes. I think people think I've gone out and bought gloves, but I had them already, it's okay. <laughs> but they're quite useful as well for hygiene reasons. But um, keep washing your hands, keep a safe distance from people. Um, hope you enjoyed the vid. Um, I'm going to just toast our, our heroic uh, comrades in arms. We had, uh, this is very nice, by the way. It's the uh, Glenlivet 1824 Founders Reserve. Absolutely fantastic. Mm. Lovely. Um, just toasting them, Charlie Brown, Franz Stiegler, both very, very courageous and heroic men on both sides of a, a terrible war. And it makes you realise that um, uh, human kindness, human humanity goes well beyond the bounds of uh, national interest and uh, you know politics and all that kind of thing. And at a time like this now where a lot of people are getting sick, uh, very important to think of our friends, relatives, neighbours, people we can help, the vulnerable, and let's all, like these guys did, let's pull together and uh, and help those in need. Anyway, thanks a lot for watching. I uh, hope you enjoyed the vid, and uh, please watch out for the detailed photograph um, uh, video coming soon. It'll probably just a bit of music, it won't have me waffling on it, um, and you'll see the details of the model.